All righty, welcome to our EconX FBLA uh, speaker series. We're excited to have all of you here. Um, over the next week, um, so today, tomorrow, and Thursday and Friday, we'll be exploring the applications of economics and business. Um, this presentation was brought to you as a collaboration between Limbrook Economics Club um, and Limbrook FBLA. Um, so hopefully, um, you'll be able to gain some more insights about American enterprise, um, as well as the kind of real world applications of economics in the business world. Um, and yeah, we'll get started. All right, so just a quick timeline of our speakers in case you don't already know. Um, so from right now to about 4.15, we'll be having Chris Maurice, um, and he is CEO of Yellow Card Financial. And tomorrow in the morning, we'll be having Professor Colin come from 10.15 to 11 a.m. And on Thursday, um, during lunchtime from 11.15 to 12 p.m., Alu Perianan will come, and he is the co-founder and CTO of Blue Jeans Networking Video Conference. And on Friday, Professor Tadillas will come from 3.40 to 4.25 p.m. And you can find all of um, the detailed information about our speakers on our Instagram at Limburg Economics. All right, so um, this speaker event will last for 25, um, sorry, 45 minutes and including the Q&A session at the end. And the norms are basically, you can ask questions through the chat feature, either publicly or privately to me, um, Cindy Chow, and you don't need to private message the speakers. And feel free to send them anytime during the event. Um, we'll mostly be probably be answering most of them at the end. And if possible, um, also keep your cameras on and stay muted while the speaker is talking. Listen and be respectful. And um, just a heads up, this event will, is recorded and will most likely be uploaded to YouTube. All right, so today's speaker, like Cindy mentioned, is Chris Maurice. He is the Chief Executive officer and co-founder of Yellow Card Financial. Um, you can check out their website at yellowcard.io. And so his company that he founded is a digital currency exchange company. And today he'll be talking about his experience uh, working, his experience founding this company as well as um, Bitcoin, et cetera, and his story. So uh, without further ado, this is Chris. Awesome, awesome. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, let's see. Uh, can I share my screen? Are you guys able to see that? Yes. Cool. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, yeah, like uh, like Joyce mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Maurice. I am the uh, the CEO of Yellow Card, and uh, you know basically uh, what Yellow Card is is the easiest way for anyone anywhere in the world to buy and sell Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, we started in Nigeria, and that was because uh, you know that's that's where we identified the the biggest need, right? And uh, you know we we feel that. Uh, access to basic financial services like crypto is a uh, basic human right uh, and should be uh, available everywhere, no matter what country or currency you're born into. Um, I guess uh, to give to give a little background on myself, so I was uh, born and raised in Southern Louisiana. So uh, I am from uh, from the uh, <laughs> the swamp, um, and uh, you know grew up there. Went to uh, went to college in Alabama. Um, and, uh, you know, somehow made it all the way over to Nigeria. Uh, so I guess uh, my story is um, a little unorthodox. And so, um, you know, I'll just, I'll take the time today just to uh, sort of uh, go through a little bit of my entrepreneurial journey, um, talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin, talk a little bit about crypto, um, and then uh, a little bit about Africa and uh, the market there, and then happy to answer any questions around uh, any of those. Um, so my uh, my journey in uh, my journey in entrepreneurship really started uh, before before Bitcoin. Um, so while I was uh, in college at uh, Auburn University, uh, I was uh, I had my own company doing clothing. I was doing clothing manufacturing, shoes, that sort of thing. I worked with a network of factories out of Pakistan, India, um, and uh, did wholesale shoes, clothing, etc. 
Um, you know, Pakistan uh, is not the easiest country in the world to move money into or out of. Uh, and so we always ran into a number of issues with things like foreign exchange. Uh, and so when I first learned about Bitcoin, it made a ton of sense. Uh, my, my friend introduced me to it back in 2013. And, uh, you know, it was it immediately clicked uh, in terms of the, the practical use cases that this, this applies to. Things like moving money into a country without the need for banks, without the need for, uh, you know, foreign exchange, etc. Uh, that being said, uh, I was I was still skeptical, right? Uh, you know, I think I think everybody's first reaction when they learn about Bitcoin is, you know, oh, cool, magic internet money, uh, whatever. And uh, so it actually took me until uh, about a year and a half later, uh, early 2015, to buy my first Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin at the time was hundred dollars, and my only regret was that I didn't buy ten thousand more of them. Um, and so. Uh, early 2015, uh, finally got into got into Bitcoin, bought my first coin, um, and uh, you know a little later that year I was on eBay, and while I was on eBay, uh, I saw Bitcoin being sold for 150% markup, and so I called up my friend that had introduced me to it, and I said, uh, you know, hey Justin, uh, you know, check this out, and sent him the link, and uh, you know, he calls me back and he says. Hey man, you know, I, I know what Bitcoin is. I know how to do Bitcoin. You know how to do eBay. You know, let's make some money. And so uh, we started selling Bitcoin on eBay for 100% markup. Um, in that first week, uh, we did over $40,000 in sales. And I thought I was dropping out of college. I was getting ready to retire at 20. Um, you know, we were, we were making unbelievable amount of money. And that's when I learned what a credit card chargeback is. So uh, what was actually happening is people online were stealing a bunch of credit cards. Uh, they, were, they were coming to us and running these stolen credit cards and waiting for one of them to hit. And when one of them hit, we would send the Bitcoin uh, and Bitcoin is irreversible. Uh, so we would send the Bitcoin. We would have no way of getting that back. And then the real owner of the card would call the bank, tell them what happened, and the bank would pull the money back from us. Uh, so we actually ended up losing, um, uh, losing an unbelievable amount of money on this experience. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it didn't, it didn't waver my, uh, my faith or my, uh, belief in Bitcoin and in crypto. Uh, but it did, uh, it did change our approach pretty significantly. Uh, and so, uh, after, after this experience and after losing all of this money, uh, we were triggered by just the concept of plastic. And so credit cards were completely off the table. Uh, the only thing that we would accept from then on was the only irreversible payment method known to man, which is cold, hard cash. And so we did the only thing that two reasonable college students in our position would do, which is every Wednesday at about 7 p.m., you could come to the Taco Bell on Gay Street in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, you could find Justin and I in the back corner table eating our Doritos Locos Taco 12-pack. Uh, you could slap a couple hundred dollars cash on the table and we would scan your QR code and give you Bitcoin. Uh, so we did this, uh, we did this for about three weeks and, uh, you know, we were talking and it was like, man, hey, this is working. Um, and uh, so we called up our friends at LSU, Yale, Georgia, Georgia Tech. Uh, and a couple other universities. And uh, within another two weeks, we had seven Taco Bells on the Eastern United States where you could walk in and buy Bitcoin. Um, and so uh, this, was, uh, this was basically how we started the company, uh, selling Bitcoin out of Taco Bells in the, uh, in the Eastern US. Uh, so we did, this, uh, we did this for about two and a half months. And then we were talking one day and we said, you know, man, we should probably do something less sketchy with our lives. And uh, that was when the original idea for Yellow Card was born. Uh, and so essentially what we wanted to do was we, we had something that we knew was working. Uh, it was just the manner in which we were doing it was number one, very sketchy, and number two, uh, not scalable. And so, uh, you know, what we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out a way that we could take what we were learning and what we were experiencing while doing this uh, on uh, these college campuses and we wanted to make something scalable. 
And so the original idea that we came up with was a gift card. We would put a gift card in gas stations, in Walmart, uh, in places like that. You could walk in, buy this gift card, and redeem it for Bitcoin. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the card that we came up, up with wasn't even yellow, so we were off to a great start. Um, this was in uh, about 2017, and uh, so we spent, we spent the majority of that year just working on this idea, and uh, you know, we, we tried to raise money. We attended a ton of different pitch competitions. I mean, we were you know, really on the circuit promoting this idea, and uh, one day... Well, uh, Justin and I were at a Wells Fargo. We met a guy who was from Nigeria and was trying to send $200 to his family in Nigeria. Um, and Wells Fargo charged him $90 to send 200 over to his family in Africa. Uh, so we pulled the guy aside and we said, you know, hey, have you heard of Bitcoin? It's free, it's instant, all of that fun stuff. And we went home later that day and we started thinking, you know, what would his family in Lagos, Nigeria do with $200 worth of Bitcoin? Uh, you know, Bitcoin solves the middle of the problem. It allows me to get things from point A to point B. But what, what would his family do when they get it there, right? Uh, you know, even in San Francisco, you would have a hard time paying your rent or buying food and surviving fully on Bitcoin. Um, and so, uh, you know, at that point, we just went back into research mode, right? What we were working on at this point was not working, right? You know, we, we had gone out, we tried to raise money, we went out, we did all these pitches, we did all the work, uh, and it just wasn't catching on. And so, uh, you know, we went back into research mode and we wanted to learn, uh, you know, how does Bitcoin work? How do things like Bitcoin work in a country like Nigeria or across the continent of Africa? And so we started doing all of this research. Uh, we started talking to people. And uh, one day uh, we met who is now uh, one of our co-founders, Minachi, um, while doing this research. And Minachi at the time was just a Bitcoin trader in Nigeria. Uh, so we started talking to him uh, just to get a better understanding of, you know, hey, what is it like in Nigeria? How do people use Bitcoin? How do, how do you buy it? How do you sell it? Uh, you know, what are people practically doing with it? And, uh, you know, Minachi uh, must have been a really smooth talker because within about two months of meeting him, uh, he convinced me to buy a one-way plane ticket to Lagos, Nigeria, having never left the United States before. I had been on a plane maybe four times in my life before starting this company. And with, <laughs> within two months of meeting a Nigerian man online, I find myself at the, uh, the Martella Muhammad International Airport in Lagos. Um, uh, little little side fun caveat. Uh, so Minachi never told me that I needed a visa. Uh, so I showed up at the <laughs> I showed up at the Lagos airport without my shots and without a visa. Um, it took me it took me four hours to get out of the airport uh, because immigrations was threatening to deport me for uh, having nothing nothing at all together. Um, and uh, so after four hours, I uh, managed to get into the country, and uh, it was, I mean, it was a life-changing experience, right? Uh, you know, I think, I think that, um, you know, when, <laughs> when it comes to uh, seizing opportunity and uh, doing crazy things like flying to Lagos, having never left the United States, um, it, you know, it's, it, it, it really is it really is true that uh, you'll never you'll never understand uh, the opportunity that's out there until you go out there and explore it yourself right uh, and so you know well while I was in Nigeria uh, it gave me it gave me the opportunity to truly understand how crypto works there right how traditional finance, has failed the country overall, how traditional finance has failed in really a large swath of the, the population of the world, right? Outside of the US, outside of Europe, uh, traditional finance and, and banking really has not, has not uh, achieved what it was uh, supposed to achieve, right? It, it, it does not make things more accessible. It does not make financial services available to the majority of humans on planet Earth.
Um, and, uh, you know, this was something that I got to experience firsthand while in Lagos. Uh, and it's something that, uh, you know, we read about and we thought that we understood, but nothing really prepares you for diving headfirst into uh, Nigeria. Um, and so, uh, you know, basically we, we took the time uh, while there on the ground to truly understand how Bitcoin works there. Uh, to understand why people need it, how people use it, how people access it in the first place. And it was really out of what we learned there that Yellow Card was born. Um, and so, you know, for, for what it's worth, uh, you know, it's important, to, it's important to do your research. It's important to uh, try to learn as much as possible about an opportunity before fully diving in. Uh, but, it, you know, for what we were trying to do and for the part of the world that we were trying to serve, it's just not something that you can learn online. Uh, you know, some things still need to be learned in person uh, with real experience. And so, uh, yeah, basically, uh, you know, we learned well there uh, exactly what problems things like Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency solve around the world. Uh, in a country like Nigeria, the local currency is called the Naira. The Naira has inflated over 30% last year, uh, and it's supposed to inflate another 15% this year. So, you know, money there is, I mean, very literally melting in your hands. And Nigeria is not even one of the worst countries in the world when it comes to inflation. Uh, this is the first major thing that we learned very quickly that things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency solve. Um, on top of that, it's a diversification and it's a diversification of risk, right? If you are investing or you are earning money in Nigeria and putting it into savings accounts, put it into investment accounts, trying to save money to buy a home or to uh, you know, just have something put away for your children in the future, uh, the reality is, is that Nigeria is just a very risky country. There's a lot of inherent risks in a country like Nigeria. And if you have your money in a savings account there, all of your risk is now in one place. Uh, so again, something like crypto uh, manages to help diversify this, right? It, it helps to uh, take some of that inherent market risk and uh, it allows you to put your money into something that is a little bit more uh, untied to your local economy and to, uh, you know, whatever might happen there. Um, and the last thing that we realized that was a major problem there was credit. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when we think about credit in the U.S., we think about like a mortgage or we think about like a credit card. Uh, but when you think about the number of things that you get on credit in the U.S., uh, it's, it's, it's a little shocking. So if you're on a phone plan, then you are getting your phone and your cell service on credit, right? You get your cell service and then you pay at the end of the month. Uh, if you have a home and you have running water in your home, that running water and the electricity in your house is all on credit. You get to use that water. And then at the end of the month, the water company is billing you for the water that you used. In Nigeria, none of that is there. You have to prepay for everything, whether it's water, whether it's electricity, whether it's your cell plan, everything has to be prepaid. Um, and, uh, you know, again, making things like credit more accessible, uh, the only way to do that is to bring in more and more creditors. And the only way to do that is to bring in more options and more marketplaces where things like credit can be accessed. And that's something that is unique to things like decentralized finance. Uh, just, just quickly talking a little bit more broadly outside of Nigeria about the, the continent of Africa in general, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's very unfortunate that uh, <laughs> they don't really teach you about Africa in school, right? I, I don't think that the average American really knows where Africa is on a map um, and certainly doesn't know where Nigeria is on a map, right? Um, and, uh, you know, despite that fact, Africa is, I mean, one of the, I mean, it, it is, it is truly, uh, the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, and Africa as a continent is going to shape 
the future of business and the future of finance for the entire world over the next 50 years. The, 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 the truth is that when you look at countries like the United States, when you look at countries like China, uh, you know, things have been growing very quickly here and very quickly in countries like China, India for many years. But that growth is starting to slow because the thing is, is once you get so big, you can only you can only grow so fast, right? Uh, Africa, Africa is where the majority of the world's growth is going to come from over the next 50 years, Africa and South America. And so it's very important that people start paying attention to and learning more about the continent and about just the, the diversity and uh, the uniqueness of the, the different cultures located across the continent, right? It's, it's, a, it's a continent of 55 very unique, very diverse countries. Um, and, uh, you know, you're already starting to see uh, some of the power, some of the financial and economic power that Africa holds in the crypto market. So right now, Nigeria, this is actually an old slide, Nigeria is now number two in the world in Bitcoin users per capita. Kenya is number five, South Africa is number six. That's, I mean, that, that's, that's massive when you consider how much, uh, how big uh, the crypto market is in countries like the US, in countries like Japan, in countries like Russia, China, India. Uh, Nigeria is number two in the world, more than any of them except for the US. Um, when it comes to uh, it, it, Google searches for buy Bitcoin, the top five countries searching for buy Bitcoin are all in Africa. And I think it just really goes to show the number of uh, the number of people that are trying to find a better way, right? Across the continent, uh, you know, banks just generally don't work. Um, and so the number of people trying to find uh, alternatives is very high. And you can see that just from a basic Google search, uh, Google Trends search. Um, and then finally, in terms of remittances, uh, there's just, there's a ton of money that's flowing into and out of the continent. And there's even more money that's flowing around the continent. Uh, you know, over $46 billion flew into, uh, into Sub-Saharan Africa in 2018. It was even more in 2019 and in 2020, uh, it looks like it's going to be upwards of $60 billion. Uh, there is a similar amount of money that is leaving the continent, that is leaving through very informal sources, where it's leaving in cash, it's leaving through, uh, you know, basically anything that's not a bank account. And then when you look at intra-African trade, when you look at intra-African finance, there's over $300 billion a year in intra-African trade and finance. There's over $300 billion a year in uh, just money movement across borders uh, in you know, these, these 55 unique countries. And these are, these are all numbers that are largely ignored uh, by the rest of the world. It's only been very recently with people like Jack Dorsey, Twitter, Square, etc., cetera, uh, looking more into the continent that uh, anybody at all has started to pay attention to what's going on there. Um, and yeah, again, you know, the, the reality is that Africa is going to really shape the way that the world works and that the world, uh, you know, uh, trades from an economic and finance standpoint over the next 50 years. Uh, and so that's, that is, uh, you know, essentially where I guess my, uh, my call on uh, you guys as the, the budding entrepreneurs of, you know, the next decade, uh, that, that would be where my call to you guys is, is to, to start looking at uh, solutions outside of uh, your comfort zone, right? Start, start looking at things that you might not know anything about today. When I started this, I had no idea where Nigeria was on a map. I probably couldn't even spell it. And, uh, you know, now we do over a million dollars a day in, a con in countries like Nigeria, Cameroon, Kenya, Botswana, South Africa. Um, and so, uh, you know, s start taking those steps outside of your comfort zone. Try to learn more about things like Bitcoin, but not just Bitcoin. Learn about things like Ethereum, learn about Maker, learn about Stellar, Libra. Uh, and then start trying to learn more about Africa as well. Start trying to learn more about the continent, how money works there. Uh, you know, the problems that people face on a daily basis uh, in Africa. And it's, it's, I think you'll be amazed at the, the number of problems that the continent has, but also the amount of opportunity that exists there because of these problems. 
And so, uh, you know, again, my, my call to anybody that wants to start a business in the next 10 years or anybody that's, that's looking to, or that, that's interested in entrepreneurship is start looking outside of your comfort zone, whether it's Bitcoin or Africa or, uh, you know, anything else. Start, start looking and start trying to understand things that you don't currently understand because the, the reality is that's where the majority of opportunity is. The majority of opportunity is in things that you and your friends and your peers don't understand uh, because that's where nobody's looking right now, right? And so, uh, you know, just because nobody's doing it right now doesn't mean that there's not a huge market for it. It doesn't mean that there's not a lot of opportunity there. So that would be uh, that would be my advice, um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to happy to answer any questions or uh, anything anything you guys might have. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Mr. Ma uh, Maurice. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll move into questions now. So the first question I got is. Um, oh, sorry, I can't. I can barely hear you. Oh, you can barely. Hear you. Um, let me is it better now or? Yes, yeah, much better. Oh, okay, all right. Um, yeah, so I said we're gonna move into the question portion. And the first question um, someone has for you is, have you ever had any regrets from yellow card? Um, have you had a time where you didn't feel like going, doing yellow card anymore and wanted to give up? Um, well, uh, man, I, <laughs> as, a, as a founder, I think I go through that every other day, but um, <laughs> Uh, the, um, the, the, the real answer, the real answer to that question would be, uh, that, uh, my, my biggest regret was during, during that early phase, uh, like I talked about where we were trying to, you know, we were trying to push this gift card and we were, uh, you know, we were going through, we were pitching, we were, uh, you know, we were trying to raise money. We were going out on like all of these, uh, uh, like competition circuits and everything. And the, the mindset that we were in at the time was that we have to raise money. It was, you know, everybody raises money. You can't start a business without raising money. We have to raise money. We have to do it. We don't, I, I don't, I don't have any money, right? I don't have, I don't have a savings account. I didn't, I didn't have a, I had maybe a thousand dollars to my name at the time. Right. Um, and so I, uh, you know, we, we just, we were stuck in this mindset of we have to raise money. We can't do it without raising money. And the, the reality is, is that there's always somewhere to start. And the, the biggest mistake and the biggest regret that I have is that we spent all of that time stuck in this mindset of we have to raise money. We have to raise money instead of just building the business and focusing on building the business. Uh, if I could go back, I would, I would just stop all of our fundraising efforts at that time and just work on building something to actually prove to investors that it was worth putting their money into. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say you know when when starting a business, don't get stuck in the mindset of you have to raise money, uh, because the reality is is that you have to prove yourself first. Nobody's going to put money into you, uh, put money into your business until you can show them that there is some promise of it working out. And so, uh, yeah, that would be, that would be my big regret was, was wasting, uh, I mean, you know, a good year where we should have been just heads down focused on building. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our second question is what was the main concern with the cash only? Did it appear suspicious to the IRS? Uh, sorry, one more time. Um, what was the main concern with the cash only? Did it appear suspicious to the IRS? No, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't that anything appeared suspicious. Uh, you know, I mean, everything we were doing was, uh, you know, was legit, right? Um, the uh, the concern was that we were collecting a bunch of cash at a you know a Taco Bell and then depositing it into a bank account, right? So <laughs> the whole thing was just very sketchy. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we definitely, we definitely knew we wanted to do something less sketchy, right? We wanted to do something a little bit more scalable that didn't involve me being at a, you know, a Taco Bell in Alabama at weird hours. Um, and, uh, you know, something that, uh, that could be, uh, you know, replicated more easily across, uh, across the country. All right, cool. Um, so our third question is, 
Are you currently living in Africa? And when you visited, how did you overcome or adapt to the language slash cultural barrier? Yeah, uh, sorry, the language slash what? Cultural barrier. Yes. So um, I I was I was living in Africa, and then uh, twenty twenty happened. Uh, um, so uh, I was in I was in. Uh, uh, I, so I actually I've been to now I've been to uh, 12 countries in Africa. Uh, Africa is still the only continent I've ever visited. I've never been anywhere else. I have no interest in Europe. So, um, but uh, yeah, I was I was living in Nigeria uh, for the majority of the end of 2019. Um, Nigeria, and then I was uh, in and out of a few other countries. Uh, 2020 came back for the holidays, and then the world blew up. Um, and so I was stuck in uh, Atlanta for most of uh, 2020. Uh, fortunately, at the end of the year last year, uh, in November, I was able to make it back to Nigeria. And so I was in Nigeria and then Kenya and um, uh, a few different parts of Central Africa for the end of 2020. Uh, right now, I'm back in the U.S. I'm in New York right now uh, and tentatively going to be back in South Africa for the next six months, starting in February. But uh, now there's a new strand of COVID there, so we'll see. But um, so the uh, the answer is yes. In a normal year, uh, I would be I would be living there at least uh, seven eight months out of a year. Um, but uh, of course, we're not in normal times. Um, and then in terms of in terms of the language uh, and cultural barrier. Um, so as far as language, uh, the reality is that everybody everywhere in the world speaks English. Um, everybody that has like uh, any sort of uh, like mid level of education, medium level of education around the world speaks English, um, which obviously is very helpful. Um, but I didn't even I didn't even bother to look at what the I never even thought about like a language barrier before I went to Nigeria. I never even looked at what the national language was. Fortunately, it was English. Found that out when I landed. Um, the, uh, the main thing that takes some adjusting to is the, the cultural differences. And uh, the, the best advice that I would have is any country that you want to do business in, and this, this applies uh, from, from everything that I understand and from the people that I've spoken with, this applies very well outside of just Africa. It applies to any part of Asia, any part of uh, Europe, especially Eastern Europe. Um, you need somebody from that country that grew up there and ideally has uh, gone to college or gone to school outside of the country. That's, that's the best person that you can work with is somebody that really understands and grew up in that country, understands that culture, grew up in that culture, but then has some experience with uh, like Western education, uh, either in the US or Europe, um, has some experience with more Western culture, uh, and that is the best way to bridge that gap because the, the reality is, is that if you just dive right in, it's going to take you a while to, to figure out all of like the cultural nuances and everything that exists. Um, and so having a really good local guide, having somebody on the ground that understands the culture there, uh, but also can relate to you is, is pretty important. Thank you. Um, so Next question is, is the progress of Yellow Card now what you expected in the past? Um, I, I, we, we've done a lot better than I ever expected. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what I expected in hindsight, but um, I certainly never expected, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to be doing what we are now. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're fortunate now to, I mean, have, I, I've you know, been able to raise money after uh, you know, proving out the concept. Uh, you know, we're live right now in five countries in Africa with four more coming uh, between this month and next month. And uh, yeah, we are, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely, uh, we're doing a lot better than, than I ever expected. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, the, the, the lesson to, to take from that is uh, you know, if you if you really believe in what you're doing, you need to stick with it. And uh, nothing happens overnight, and nothing happens in a short amount of time. Um, I'm only 24, uh, so I'm I'm also you know pretty young, not as young as you guys, but uh, you know for for me or for you guys, you know, two years is 10% of your life, right? That seems like a long time. 
two years is not actually that long of an amount of time. Uh, and so it's, it's important to uh, kind of remember that, that even though it might seem like a long time to you, uh, you know, at, at your age or at the, the position that you're in currently, it's not actually that much time in the grand scheme of things. And so it's, it's important to stick with it. Uh, you know, it's, things are not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in a month. Um, and so, you know, when, when you're building a company, you really need to, you need to find something that you truly believe in and that you can stick with for, for a good amount of time. All right, um, cool. So we will have our last question of the day. Um, and it is, how has COVID affected Yellow Card Financial? Yeah, so um, other than me having to evacuate back to the U.S., um, it, uh, you know, I, I always feel bad saying this because obviously, you know, COVID has, uh, you know, really hurt a lot of people, but uh, it has overall, it's been really good for, uh, for our business and, and not just our business, but for fintech in general. And I think that anybody that you talk to in fintech or in uh, sort of uh, new age um, uh, finance or, or tech industry uh, would tell you the same thing. Um, it's, a, you know, it's driven everybody online for just about everything. People are looking for, you know, alternatives to banking. People are looking for alternatives, especially outside of the U.S. People are looking for alternatives to their currency, right? Like I said, uh, you know, the Naira in Nigeria inflated 30% last year. That's, that's almost 100% due to COVID and what it did to international markets, to oil, et cetera. Uh, South Africa saw a similar amount of inflation that it's, it's starting to bounce back from. Uh, and, uh, you know, countries like Zambia saw something like 20% inflation. Uh, you know, the, the, the inflation has been very bad uh, across, across the continent. And so it, it just, it's driven a lot of people to look at things like Bitcoin to look for alternatives to their, their current system because the current system just doesn't work, right? And, uh, you know, it, it took, obviously it took something like COVID to expose that, but, uh, you know, it, it, that's, that's really driven a lot of people towards uh, FinTech. All right, thank you so much for your time today. Um, yeah, it was great hearing you. And yeah, we're gonna wrap up now, so.